Bible reading is Psalm 32. So if you have your Bibles or iPads or phones or any device with you, if you'd like to turn to Psalm 32, otherwise you can follow on the screen with me. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all who are upright in heart. Good evening. My name's Jonathan Scouton. I attend... 10.30 usually uh, with my family, but thanks for having me here tonight. Then sings my soul. (laughs) What a song, huh? And as we sing it, you think, there was a man who was responding to God with song. Songs are such a passionate and powerful way which we respond to things we learn, things we know, events that happen in our lives. I've got this wonderful little hymn book at home. Um, I was having a rough day at work, and you wouldn't believe it. I found a hymn book. <laughs> um, there, was a, there was a stack of, um, what do you call it, junk mail. And in it was this little red book. And it wasn't Karl Marx's manifesto. It was a little book called um, Redemption Songs. And uh, it's, oh, it's been a blessing, I'll tell you what. Um, as, I re- as I read through them, uh, and I started to post some of the lyrics on, my, on, on Facebook, and uh, I had a bit of a catalogue building up, and I've got this uh, atheist friend. He started re- replying to all of my posts with these uh, scientific uh, extravaganzas, like um, findings and all other sorts of things, and one of his posts was under each one of mine. And it made me reflect, though. We, c- we sing about God... And I wonder what you find worthy of your song, worthy of your praise. I don't know that uh, there's many things that have been written about as often as God, or as many people have responded uh, to God in song as anything else. I know that love's up there, um, and relationships. But the humble song is a, is a powerful thing. It's a powerful way of responding to either something great, maybe something terrible, and uh, I think King David understood this as well, because he takes of what he knows of God and what he's experienced in life, and he writes a song, Psalm 32, because uh, a psalm is a song, and it's a mascal, we're told. And our mascal is um, quite is understood to be an instructive psalm. So he's written it not just in regards to his response to God and his thankfulness for forgiveness, but also as a way to share what he knows, what he's learned, what he's experienced with others. It's to make others wise. He's been made wise. God's helped him to grow in wisdom, and now he wishes to share that wisdom with others. So he writes this song. And uh, it's, a, it's an old song. We're talking about 3,000 years old. Um, and it's incredible because I've been blessed in the, in the reading and studying of it, and, and I really hope that we'll be blessed tonight uh, as we look at it. We're going to look at a few things, uh, the joy of forgiveness, but also the sorrow of obstinance. When I say obstinance, I mean unrepentance. When we ignore our sin, when we hide from God, 
We'll also consider the um, God's willingness to forgive. We'll look at sharing what we've learned with others. There's some lessons from David that, we're, that I think we can learn from. And finally, an application, something to go home with. All right. Before I get stuck in, though, I'd like to pray. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are good to us. And our, I just acknowledge that in our nature and in our hearts, we run from you and flee from you when we should run to you. And fl- Sorry that we're slow to do it. But Lord, you are gracious and kind. And we read about that and we've experienced that, we ask that you be kind to us tonight, that you be present with us and cause our hearts to sing. Amen. Verses 1 and 2. I'm just going to lift this up if I can a little. Oh, I'll pull it out. There we go. All right, verses 1 and 2. The picture. The picture will give you a clue where I'm going. (laughs) But firstly, uh, as we look at verses 1 and 2, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. I think it's worth noting who it doesn't say is blessed here. It doesn't say, Blessed is the careful law keeper. Blessed are the wealthy. Blessed are those who have experienced the world and learnt many things. Blessed are those who have done well in their studies. Blessed are those who have uh, great relationships or whatever else you might put in there that we consider blessed today. No, the sinner is blessed here. It says, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. The story of the prodigal son is one of my favourites. A son who turns his back on his father and he takes his inheritance and he squanders it. He, do, he, he fulfills all of his heart's desire. Everything he looks at that he thinks he'll find enjoyment, he tackles full on. He squanders his wealth and his pockets end up empty. And he ends up feeding from a pig's trough. Whilst he does this, as sorrows and troubles have caught up with him and overtaken him, in his depression... He thinks of his home, where his servants are treated better than he lives now. He decides to return. As he walks home, racked with guilt, he is probably wondering how he'll be treated when he gets home. How will his father respond? His father sees him a long way off and runs out. Runs out. And I love the words words of the son here. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I don't deserve to be called your son. The father wraps his arms around him, wraps his cloak around him, puts a ring on his finger. He says, my son was dead, but now he's alive. Was lost, but now he's found. Come home. We'll slaughter the lamb. We'll have a party. Let's celebrate. What joy there was in that home over a sinner coming home, over a sinner repenting. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Similarly, we find Jesus telling a parable about a tax collector who goes to the temple to pray. When he's there, he doesn't lift his eyes up to heaven, but rather looks down. He knows what he is. He beats his chest and he says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. We read that he went home happy says that he went home justified. He went home right with God. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And I could go on, and I will. (laughs) There was a woman, and she was known in town as a sinner, a filthy woman. And a rich, well-to-do Pharisee was having a party, and Jesus was there. And she arrived uninvited, went up to Jesus, and wet his feet with her tears. And then cleaned and dried his feet with her hair. People looked on in disgust. And Jesus said this, A man had a great debt, and another man had a little. 
Both were forgiven. Who loved more? And the crowd stubbornly responded, I suppose the one who was forgiven more. And he says, you've answered correctly. That's right. He who is forgiven much loves much. And she has loved much and is forgiven much. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Now, I don't know if I mentioned, but forgiven here is another word for, is for, um, sorry, blessed here is another word for happy. Okay, happy is he whose transgressions are forgiven. First two finishes with the, the line, in whose spirit is no deceit. When I first read it, I thought, it sounds like there's something commendable about this repentant cinder. There's no deceit in him. But I think it means this. A deceiver is a pretender. There's someone who puts the best behind their back and offers you what's left, pretending that's all. Or maybe they come and give you a kiss and a hug whilst inwardly they despise you and talk about you behind, their back, behind your back. And so people can be with God, or so we are with God, that we go to him and we put our best foot forward, but we actually hide our true self. And we think we can deceive him. We can't. I know this. Psalm 51 verse 17 reads, A broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. What I think we're reading here in verse 2 in regards to no deceit is someone who will come to God and bear their soul. Someone who will come to God not pretending, but acknowledge what they are. For me to acknowledge what I am, a wretch, not one deserving of his kindness, but one who is in desperate need of his mercy and grace. Who is the one who is forgiven? I believe we are being told the one who comes honestly, with their disgrace displayed, their wretchedness revealed. What medicine can be prescribed for a hidden illness? How can one be shown mercy? who refuses to admit their fault. But when we do, we end up in drought. Verses 3 to 4. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped, as in the heat of summer. Now I'd like to note here, uh, before I get into it, is that there is, a, there is hardship and suffering in this life that isn't related to your sin personally. When, um, and G- when, when, uh, when a tower fell down on 18 people and killed them in Jerusalem while Jesus was around, some people came and asked him about it. And he said, these people weren't worse sinners than any of you. We live in a broken world. It says, through one man sin entered the world, and it's wreaked havoc ever since. And all one need do is look at the life of Jesus to know that we will suffer in this life, not necessarily just because of our own wrongdoing. Jesus was perfect, sinless, and yet he suffered. He was tortured, killed, falsely tried, and yet he was righteous. And I wanted to make note of that because I don't want us to wrongly understand maybe some hardships or suffering that we're going through. It might not be due to things that you've done, but the world in which we live. In saying that, this is not the case with David. David's suffering is due to his sin and his unwillingness to acknowledge it and repent of it. If you notice in verse 4, it says, Your hand was heavy upon me. It was God who was drying up David's life. He was putting the weight on David, putting him under the heat lamp. Sin is irrational. It causes us to not do things we ought to, to not do things we ought to, and do things we ought not to. That was a bit of a twister. But it means that a hungry man refuses to eat, and a thirsty man refuses to drink, and a guilty man refuses to go to the only place that he can find forgiveness and refreshment. 
Now, I'm not talking... I want to just uh, put two things separate here. Outward appearances and inward appearances. Outward things and inward things. For one can sin and look as if they enjoy it. One can sin and prosper, for the wicked do prosper. It's the groan of... (laughs) It's the groan of the psalmist and others in Scripture constantly. Why do the wicked prosper? And yet inwardly, they're poor. We read about the um, Laodiceans in Revelations. They thought they had everything, but really their actual state was naked, miserable, and poor. And yet you can look poor and be very rich, for poverty is to be cut off from God. Now why is... God's hand heavy upon David? Why is he making life hard for his servant? I want to say it's because he's kind. It's because he's gracious. It's because he loves him. God disciplines the one he loves. Now, if I was to put a coin in your pocket, it probably wouldn't bother you. You might even forget about it. You could walk about it all day long, and you probably wouldn't notice it till you put it in the washing machine and it clinked around. If I put a bag of cement on each one of your shoulders, <laughs> you wouldn't think much of me. Um, but you'd also pretty soon be heavy, weighed down, sweating, looking for help or wanting to put them down. This is God with David. He wants him to feel the misery of his obstinacy, the sorrow of his sin, that he might turn and find refreshment. If you think about a splinter. If you leave it in your skin, it gets sore and sorer. It gets pus and festers. What needs to happen is, it needs to be dug out. And then it can begin to heal. God reminds us not just to turn to him in this life, but also that this life is not our home. The things that we suffer can remind us of that. And it's because he's kind that we wouldn't set our eyes on here, but something far greater. I want to say sin is far worse than a splinter. For the torment of the soul through the guilt of sin and the assuredness of judgment weighs heavier and it persists longer. It saps your strength, robs you of your joy. And like a man without water in the heat of the day, that's how you feel, but you lie in your bed at night. This might not be how you look on the inside, but it could be how you feel. It might not be how you look on the outside, but it might be how you feel on the inside. So what must one do? What can one do? Well, verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. He didn't go to others. Not first, anyway. Where did David go? To the Lord. We have to come to terms with God being more willing to forgive than we often are to repent. God is gracious. And we have to come to terms with his character. That as we sung this morning, holy are you, Lord. He is holy. In some ways, we're like him, and in many ways, we're not. We have to come to terms with both his his wrath and his anger and his righteous judgment, but also we have to come to terms with his compassion and his kindness and his gentleness and his mercy. And in contemplation of any of them, I find you're either humbled, you're either humbling, and they make the best sense on your knees. I was talking with a fellow at work, and... um, we were, discussing, we were discussing death and uh, whether or not we were afraid of it. He was afraid of death. And I encouraged him that that was good, <laughs> that he ought to be. It's a correct response, you, don't, you know, because after death comes judgment. And he, uh, he asked me if I was, and I, rep- I replied about my judgment having already taken place. And we got to speaking about the gospel and the kindness of God and that with one look to Jesus and, uh, and, uh, and asking God for forgiveness, he'll grant it. Now, 
he was shocked. <laughs> and we continued to speak some more. And um, he said, what about those really bad people? You know, the really, really bad ones. You're saying they could just, one look to Jesus, repent of their sins, and be forgiven. I told him the story about the man on the cross. He's like, right, okay, all right. Um, the repentant sinner, that is, uh, that we see in Luke. And, uh, yeah, he asked some questions about good people. I said, well, what do they need to repent to? Anyway, it went on. And he, he finally, he said to me, I don't believe it. It sounds too easy. He struggled, not with God's anger, but God's kindness. It's unmatched generosity, isn't it? I think, if we're honest, we can struggle with it too. That God would be kind to people that we wouldn't. Now this side of the cross, we are, we've got a privileged position, a privileged viewpoint. Um, how do I know God will forgive me? The cross. Think about it. He, what lengths he's gone to, to send Christ from heaven to earth, to live the life that I couldn't, to die the death that was mine to die, to be raised from the dead, to ascend to heaven, and to mediate on my behalf to the Father. Can I be right with God? Jesus. But David didn't have that, did he? He knew things, for sure. He, yeah. But he didn't know and he didn't see the things that we saw about, especially in regards to Christ. So I think David, but he still sounds confident, doesn't he? Because in verse 5 we read, you forgave the guilt of my sin. So where does David's confidence come from? Firstly, I think the scriptures. David was a Bible man. And I think he knew his Bible well. The stories of Israel and the story of, the, of Abraham and Noah and Adam. He knew these stories and he saw God's interactions with men. Men of faith and yet sinful men. He knew the scriptures and he knew the promises in them. And he'd learned about the character of God. And whilst he knew that God was just, he'd learned that God is also kind and merciful. In fact, the kings of Israel were often to, were, were known for being merciful. And that's because their God was. Secondly, I think his experience. Now, the word for forgiveness used in this psalm is the picture of a burden lifted or a barrier moved out of the way. Now, King David is delighting in the forgiveness of his sins. How can we delight? How could he delight in a burden lifted unless he felt it lifted? How could he delight in a barrier removed unless he sensed in some way that barrier removed? How could he delight in a debt paid unless he sensed in some way that that debt was paid? Now, I don't know if you know about, um, well, you probably do, but in Israel, they used to get a sheep and when it, before it was slaughtered, the sinner would put their hand on their head and confess their sins, and then it would have its throat cut, and the blood would run out as a visual sign of the penalty of sin put onto another. And I don't know how an Israelite could have placed their hand on the, on the head of an animal, confessed their sin, and seen that blood run out, and not felt as well as known my sin has been dealt with. So you too can look to Christ and in your, in, a, in your heart's eye see your hand upon his head and his blood shed. And I hope not just know, but through the Holy Spirit to sit all, <laughs> just be overwhelmed with the sense in which your sin has been paid for. Verses 6 and 7. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Mm. Pardon me. 
we can only give of what we have. We can only share of what we ourselves know. What David has learnt, he's now able to share with others. Having, been, having experienced grace, having received grace, he's now apt at telling and sharing it with others. I think of it, as we consider this for ourselves, I think evangelism has a lot to do with honesty. What I mean is, we all know what we are, and we all know what we do. And we often, often speak of those things when we introduce ourselves to each other, when we talk with one another. Hi, I'm not actually Bob, but hi, I'm Bob. I'm a mechanic. I like cycling, for example. You know, I'm a mother, I'm a father. I'm a doctor, I'm a nurse. We know what we are and we know what we do. And what David is doing is just sharing what he is and what, he do, what he's done. And when it comes to us in this regard, what I'm saying is, I'm a Christian. I went to God with sins like scarlet and I walked away clean. David speaks of mighty waters. I think these mighty waters are a picture of judgment. He knew the story of Noah. He knew what the waters did to the earth. But he also knew what happened to Noah in the ark. There were mighty waters that Israel passed through safely. And Miriam burst forth in song, clapping her tambourine. But the Egyptians' bodies were littered all along the shore. What we can learn from this is that God is both a judge and a refuge. Consider David. God's presence was an oppression to David whilst he continued in his sin. But look what honest confession and full forgiveness will do. Our judge becomes our refuge. David sought to hide from God, but now he hides in him. And such it is for those who are reconciled to God. See, even if you think of Adam and Eve in the garden after they ate their fruit, what was their first response? They ran and hid, as if God couldn't find them or didn't know where they were. And what did God do? He found them and he clothed them. Judge and refuge. What really we ought to do when we find ourselves perhaps in that similar situation as Adam and Eve, though it's not in our nature, but it is in our new nature, is to run to God and confess our sin. But just like water on dry ground, so is forgiveness to a guilty soul. Verses 8 and 10. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. The bit and bridle is a, just the muzzle, um, and the bit goes in the mouth. It causes pain to the horse or donkey in order to steer it in the direction it should go. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Now, whether this is the Lord speaking or whether it's David, both of them are shepherds at heart. Um, so, so I think it could be either. Either way, they both have uh, a watchful eye and a tender care for the sheep they have responsibility for. And there's a clear lesson here that a disobedient horse suffers more cuts and bruises than an obedient one. David, or we're being, we're being encouraged here to have a tender heart and listen to the whispers or the words, the sweet commands of our master. For we are, we do have understanding. And I think we're to understand this, that the point, he's actually in this, even in this, he's calling us to himself. The goal of this is that we would come to him. It says in verse 9, or they will not come to you. The goal is that you would go to him, that you would come to him. And for what purpose? Verse 10, the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. God is calling you to him so that he can love you, so that he can surround you with his unfailing love. 
What a master. What a master. It reminds me of Jesus' words in Matthew 23, 37. How I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Do you see God's heart for his people? I hope you do. For that is indeed the desire of David, that you would see and know God's heart. And once you understand that, you wouldn't need to be trained with bit and bridle because you'd run to him. Why wouldn't you? He's kind. He's calling you to himself to surround you with shouts of deliverance, with his unfailing love. He's calling you to, to be at home with him, to be on travels with him. But the, Jesus says, after the, the um, verse about gathering you under the wings, it says, and you were not, but you were not willing. David here is saying, be willing. Go to him. Don't be stubborn of heart. Go to him. Understand he's calling you to him. Verse 11, the application. What an application we have here. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Here's what you need to do, folks. If you have gone to the Lord, acknowledge your sin, confess your guilt, and been forgiven, go home and be glad. Maybe sing a song. That's what we're told here. Be glad. God has done it. He has done it. He has secured your forgiveness. He has poured out his love towards us in his Son. And if you have looked to, to, to Jesus, be glad, rejoice, sing. We were the guilty, now the guiltless, the blind who now see, the lost now found, captives set free. Hallelujah, huh? Two notes and a story to finish. The first is about a woman named Michal. David, King David's wife, Saul's daughter. Now, King David wanted the ark in Jerusalem. He tried to do it. They didn't do it right. People died. They tried again a second time. And David danced his heart out before the ark as it entered into the city. He danced exuberantly and excitedly. Um, but Michal was looking out the window, saw him dancing, and it says she despised him in her heart. So David finishes, he goes inside, and she's there waiting. He looks at her, she looks at him. She says, what a fool you've made of yourself. What a disgrace. And he says to her, I will celebrate even more to the Lord because I have more important things to worry about than your opinion of me. David cared about the Lord's opinion of him. And he knew that the Lord was pleased with his celebration. Because what was David doing but responding with gratitude, responding with thankfulness. Secondly, a message like this about confession and forgiveness, it can seem sometimes like it's for someone just starting out on the way. Something we do at the beginning, but don't continue in. I want to say no way. It's something we continue in. When you read in Revelation about the church in Ephesus, it says... They had forgotten the love they had at the, at the start. Remember from where you have fallen. What joy there is in coming to God. This is who I am, Lord. You know, a sinner. And hearing his words, forgiven, loved, shouts of deliverance. It's something we continue to do. And it's also evident in the psalm. David wasn't new to the faith. He, he's a man who had walked with the Lord. Yet we find him here, obstinate, but acknowledging his sin and being forgiven. And also it says, you who are upright in heart. This is a call for the saints. Continue in faith and repentance. For God is gracious and kind. Finally, a story, I think, of a man to be envied. It was... Um, I went into church one day, and they were singing, and there was a man down the back, and I just remember him, because he was in his, he's probably in his 40s, and he was weathered. You could tell he'd lived a hard life, leathery skin, wrinkles, and that look on his face like he'd seen a lot, more than I would probably ever understand. Sun-bleached hair, wiry body, 
I hope you're getting the picture. And he didn't look at me, but I watched him as he danced. People sang, and he danced. And I saw such delight in the way that he moved. And I recognized that here was a man who was just responding genuinely to what we're reading about in this passage. I also had further interactions with him as time went on, and he was a, very gen- he was a generous and loving man. But I saw in that moment, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. Happy is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. And in whose spirit is no deceit. 